Because we are a family. That's why we gather. We had an interesting question come up, our family. It's just, the question came from somebody who's been a Christian for a long time, somebody who loves the Lord, following the Lord, asked the question, what is the purpose of Good Friday? I mean, what's special about it? It shows you why we need to keep teaching, keep remembering, and why we don't necessarily come to church so we can learn new things from the pastor. We come to be reminded of things that we willfully forget. Or just come to church not realizing that there are people who come from churches or places where they don't teach what should be taught. And here's how I, 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 I want to just start with this picture. We think it's special Good Friday. Why? Because at least this country gives a holiday for Good Friday. So they must acknowledge it in some way. In the land of my birth, Friday is not a holiday. Churches have a service at night because people work. Easter comes on Sunday, so it's not a holiday. And Monday is a normal work day. That's a country that was founded by people who were fleeing religious persecution so they could worship the Lord and their Savior Jesus Christ in the manner according to the Bible. And here we say there's a holiday, it's great. But now it's not really truly a holiday because shops and things are now going to be open, but not all the way through the night, but partially. Generally when Someone dies, I don't know what the tradition is here, but I know in the land of my birth, the tradition is when someone important dies, they lower the flag down to halfway. And they leave it there for all day. And it's something that everybody would know. When there's a holiday, everybody doesn't necessarily know why there's a holiday, we just know that there's holidays. But when you see a flag down halfway down the pole, you say, who died? Something happened. And questions begin to be asked. the most impactful death in the history of all mankind, and there is no flag. There is no remembrance. There's a holiday so that people would say, I guess it goes as a package in some way, or there's more honor given because we throw more holidays at it. And, and in the country where I come from, they throw holidays around like confetti or candy to satisfy the latest social cause to appease some of the masses. But let's make a holiday. Replace some of the older ones who seem to be out of sync with today's culture. Good Friday. Why is it called Good Friday? We're going to answer that question this morning. Exactly why it's called Good Friday. And I really want to just, uh, in this short really exposition that we're going to have. I really want you to learn why it's going to be called Good Friday and three specific occurrences that come out of the Gospel of Matthew that I want to point out to you. Very important things that happened that relate to our human existence. If you have your Bibles, open them to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27, there are three events that took place on that Friday that you could say are the greatest events necessary, necessary for our existence, our being, and our, our future. We're going to read some of Matthew chapter 27. And I'll skip some places and go because they're, they're specific events. The first occurs from verses 1 in chapter, where am I at here? The first occurs in chapter 26 from verses 36 to 46. What is this event? 
It was a resistance of the greatest temptation. A resistance of the greatest temptation. In every case, Jesus did these three acts. The first was he resisted the greatest temptation through something called the cup. The cup. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, So you men could not keep watch with me for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again a second time and prayed, saying, My father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, your will be done. Again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them again and went away and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. Now, lest I help you with maybe some confusion, because we're thinking Good Friday. For the Jews, Friday began 6 o'clock Thursday evening. In our reckoning. So when the sun set on Thursday, right after their Passover meal that they had, Friday began. That began Friday. And it goes until Friday at 6 p.m. the next day. That is Friday. Jesus' Friday began right when Friday began. It didn't begin when the sun rose and he was tried and crucified. It began here. So this is Friday. He went to a garden that they'd normally been to. They'd been there many times. Quiet, restful, great memories. They knew this place. And he said to his disciples, you sit here while I go over there and pray. As usual, Jesus went customarily to pray. And he took with him again Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John, specifically. And and here's a case where we see our Lord saying he was grieved and distressed. We should take note of that. His day began grieved and stressed. Where do you know Jesus to wake up and he's grieved and distressed? Agitated, yes, when he up overturned the temple at the temple and he overturned all the tables of the people, the money changers. Yes, a little agitated, but grieved and distressed. And then he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. Keep watch with me. Watch for what? Watch for what? His concern is for them, but he is grieved and distressed. That's what we want to find out what this is about. And he wants them to be praying, specifically. Well, what was Jesus praying, specifically? There's two things he was praying. The first, we find, beginning in Matthew 27, verse 39. And he went a little farther, a little beyond them, and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. A phrase we know well. A phrase maybe we assume some things. Oh, yes, Jesus, no, he's coming to Jerusalem to be crucified. It was okay to talk very strongly when there's still time left, but now the day is very short and, and he is, he's contemplating this horrible death of crucifixion. Could that be it? Let this cup pass from me, 
yet not as I will, but as you will. Well, I would say I don't think the text stands up to that kind of, uh, that, that type of interpretation. The scrutiny will not allow it because his prayer was not answered. He did die. And he was bold in setting his face like flint to go to Jerusalem and telling his disciples, I must go to die. We must go. I don't think it very tenable that Jesus would come all the way to the edge of the cliff and then stop at the end and go, no, no. Could it be that he was concerned that he would actually not suffer the wrath of man, but the wrath of God coming as Father? Certainly that is a quite possible conclusion. But again, we know that that prayer also was not answered. And if we understand those two views, we would say Jesus is saying in his humanity, he's asking for something different than his Father's will. But he will submit to his Father's will. Personally, I find difficulty with that. I know there are many who would say, yes, that's his humanity and his deity fighting and, and wrestling and that mystery that we can't understand. And, and, I, and I don't disagree that there's going to be, in his human state, there has to be great problems. The Gospel of Luke tells us he, is, he sweated so profusely drops of blood came out. And, and medically, that, that is a condition that can happen, but it is so severe <clears throat> It could bring one to the point of death. <coughs> so he was concerned. Blood coming out of the pores of his skin. So much so that an angel came to minister to him. As he prays this prayer, my father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. I believe there is a third possible interpretation here which I believe is strong we're not given very many words we have to study and, and, and decide and, and, and where, what, what is going on with Christ here and I don't doubt that in his humanity it's a very stressful time but this prayer my father if it is possible that word if could really be translated since and we know it is possible because he goes on and says, all things are possible with you. When you combine Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He says, let this cup pass from me. He does not say, let it pass by me. From me would indicate he has it. He has it. And then he says, yet not as I will, but as you will. And I, I don't want to fuss over a few of the little words here, but notice that little word, as. Quite important in this verse. As is a comparative, meaning don't, don't let this cup pass from me in the manner of, in the way of, I asking for it, but do it because it is in the manner of, the way of, your will. Meaning, it is a fulfillment of Scripture, Father. It's what you have said in the past. That's what I want to come to pass. I don't want to ask you something new, something different, something opposed to what you had written in the past. I don't want to do that. I want to ask according to exactly how you've written it. So don't, because I just now asked, let it pass from me, that you do it because you love me. Do it because this is who you are. And you have, you've written this. Now, what is this cup? Well, this cup is very clearly, throughout the Old Testament, is the wrath of God, the, 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 the pressed wine wrath of God that people will drink. Let me just read what Jesus is now pouring over Scripture Isaiah chapter 51, verses 21 and 22. Therefore, please hear this, you afflicted, who are drunk but not with wine. Thus says the Lord, the Lord, even your God, who contends for his people. Behold, I've taken out of your hand the cup of reeling, the chalice of my anger. You will never drink it again. 
he's holding on. God said, Psalm 16, verse 8. Verse 10, Psalm 16, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. He is praying through Scripture. He is hanging on to Scripture, which is about Him. You will not allow your Holy One to see decay. But not as I will, but as you will, Father. And in the midst of that prayer, He came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And said to Peter, Peter, so you men could not keep watch with me for one hour. We just had a great Passover meal. And you couldn't do that. So he went away a second time and prayed again. My father, if this cannot pass away, unless I drink it, your will be done. Notice that. Verse 42 combined with verse 39. It cannot pass away from me. Unless I drink it, which means if it's going to go away, I have to drink it first. He knows that. He is not praying to not drink it. What is he praying for? He is praying for his father to take the empty cup out of his hand and not to refill it up with again more wrath and say, drink it again and again and again. What is he praying for? Not that he would suffer on the cross. And not that he would suffer the separation from the Father in that mysterious way that we can't understand. He's praying that he would not remain in that state and he would be able to resurrect and he would pass through death. That is what he's praying. Because you won't take it unless I drink it. I'm going to drink it, but I pray that you take it. He's wrestling. Satan left him in the wilderness to find a more opportune time. Gave him three questions. Jesus easily took all three of them. Be gone, Satan. I'm leaving you for a more opportune time. This is that time. The time now when you are going to meet the moment of your mission. And do you really think God will raise one who became sin for the world and pass through what nobody else has done? You really think so because you've already separated from the Father in a way because you're now here on earth in the flesh. And you, your glory is not exposed, it's hidden. And so you have that separation, which is why Jesus said, Father, return to me the glory which I had with you before the world was in John 17, just a few hours earlier. He knows that separation of being Jesus in the flesh and that will always remain. And he did that for us to become incarnated with us. And he knew that. And he's feeling that separation already. And he's saying, do you think really you in your separated state, when you die as the sin of the world and you will go down, that in the wrath of God that he will still find you that lovable to be able to pass through? He is sweating blood. The temptation you won't raise. Is that not for us believers what Satan throws at us every day? Can God be trusted? Can he be trusted to forgive? Can he be trusted knowing how you've been this week? Can he be trusted truly to say your end is secure regardless of how the last month has been, regardless of where you've, you've totally disowned him in conversations, regardless of how you've tried to put sin away in a closet so that nobody sees it thinking God won't see it because he, you know you've just worshipped him. Knowing who you are, do you think he will be 
faithful? Do you think he will be truly loving to you and you will resurrect? Do you know what's going to happen once you close those eyes? Are you sure? Are you really sure? And we're tempted, aren't we, to look back and go over our life. We're tempted on those decisions we've made. We're tempted on those times when we, we really just put it away and buried that thing. And we're tempted to review, aren't we? Jesus never reviewed his works or his life. He went right to Scripture and says, not as I will, but as you will, because you've said it. What an encouragement for us. He defeated this massive temptation called the cup. And not only that, when he was praying, notice here, as he was finding them sleeping, he was, in verse 41, he said, keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The other thing he was praying for was for his disciples to not fall into temptation. He's praying for them. While he is battling his own temptation, he's praying for them. By the way, do you know that is a way as you're battling your own temptations, when you start praying for others, it's amazing what happens in the settling of your heart. When you start praying for others by name and you start worried about others and their falling, you're not battling with your own temptation as much anymore, are you? Your mind is on, what about them? What about them? He gives us right here, not only in how he battled the greatest temptation of the greatest force of sin and Satan and defeated that temptation, but gave us hope. Hope! Why? Because he had hope in scriptures. So hope defeated his greatest temptation called the cup. Secondly, secondly, in chapter 27, beginning with verse 33, down to verse 54, it's what we read earlier. He was crucified, and there he endured the greatest humiliation. The greatest humiliation. We know that he defeated the greatest temptation and to help give you something here that will indicate that this is not just my perspective in Hebrews chapter 5 Jesus says in verse I mean the writer of Hebrews says in Matthew in uh, Hebrews chapter 5 verse 7 in the days of his flesh he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. When did Jesus offer up prayers and supplication with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death? The writer tells us right there what Jesus was praying. And he was heard because of his piety. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he had suffered. He was never disobedient. He learned continual obedience to fight this. And he prayed with tears, crying that his father would be true to his word because he's going through it himself as a man and as God together. And hope got him through that. Now he is after having been tortured. The original designers of the crucifixion process were the Persians, and then it fell to the Greeks, and then the Romans really mass-produced it. By the time Jesus was crucified, there were over 30,000 crucifixions. Some 800 Pharisees had been crucified about 40 years earlier by their own people, the Sadducees. And uh, it's a horrific process. The, 
they came here to Golgotha, verse 33, after Jesus had been dragging his, his cross out. Verse 32 tells us Simon of Cyrene was helping him. Verse 35, and when they had crucified him, that's all it says right there, and when they crucified him. That's when they laid the beams on the ground and drove the large iron spikes into his ankles, into the cross, and most probably through his wrists to hold him on the cross as opposed to binding them, and then lifting it up and dropping it into the hole, which would be at least 30 to 60 centimeters deep. And the, hole dro and the cross drops with him on the cross, hitting. And then the process begins having to lift up, pushing against the nail embedded in his ankles, pushing up to take a breath, exhale, and come back down. As the Romans made sure he stayed alive because the point of it was making the maximum exposure of pain. Matthew tells us when they crucified him. That's what we're talking about. That's what Jesus endured. And until we understand how his day began, it began in the garden with this unbelievable temptation. Taken through a trial, beaten, scourged, flesh ripped off his back, thorns on his head, like African thorns, stuck in, blood coming everywhere, unable to breathe, the pain like fire, and then every time he has to breathe, he has to push against the nails embedded into the skin and the bone. Mark tells us, the crucifixion began at 9 a.m. on the dot. That's when it began. The third hour. The crucifixion began. During those three hours, Jesus spoke four times. Four times. And in those times, especially in the Gospel of Luke records, he addressed his father. And who was he addressing his father to? Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. Who are these people he's talking about? Well, we can see them right here in Matthew. The first, we can call them the ignorant, wicked people. The ignorant, wicked people, who are they? Well, basically it's the Roman guards, verse 27, the Roman cohort around him, stripping him, scourging him, spitting on him, beating him, mocking him. Notice in verse 33 and 34, it's the word they. They came to a place called Golgotha. They gave him wine to drink mixed with gall. They had crucified him. These are the Romans. Had no idea about Jewish history. Had no idea about Messiah. Matter of fact, they knew that Pilate declared him innocent. They knew that. But they didn't care. Innocent or guilty, that's not our point. Ours is to execute the orders of Pilate. That's what we do. Not our fault. Their orders. Something to do with being claimed king, which is certainly not worthy of death. They're ignorant, truly, of the word of God, ignorant of the history of the world, ignorant of what's going on, and looking directly at Christ and saying, not my problem. The second group are what we would call the knowing wicked. They knew something but really didn't follow, not much. Knew something like you, you learned it in second grade history class. Who are they? These are, verse 38, at that time, two robbers were crucified with them, one on the right and one on the left, and no doubt Barabbas, who was set free. Insurrectionists, robbers and murderers of the worst kind, only cared about themselves and their own enrichments. They would kill someone for a cell phone. This is who they were. They were not looking for nationalistic revival. They were not looking for any kind of uprising. They were just looking to enrich themselves. And we know that they knew because 
the books of Mark and Luke tell us, the one robber cried out says, if you're the Christ, save yourself. He knew what the Christ meant. He knew the history. If you're the Christ, save yourself. And not only that, in verse 44 of our text, the robbers who had been crucified with him were also insulting with the same words. What were the same words? He saved others. He cannot save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. They understood. He claimed to be king of Israel. What that meant, that that's the Messiah. They knew that. And they were up there with him and they were mocking him as well. They were the knowing wicked. Who else were they? There's the cultural wicked. Who are this? These are the people who attended the synagogue. These are the people who would be doing something on Sunday through Friday, and then Saturday they would say, oh, let's go to the synagogue and listen to the rabbi and do all the things we do because we're Jews. And then they would go back out and behave however they wished that would be culturally appropriate, which in those days it would be stealing, it'd be cheating, it'd be even committing adultery, it'd be all those things. Verse 39, and those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. These are the ones who said, hail, Hosanna, son of David. Let me welcome you into Jerusalem. That's what it is to be culturally religious. You believe one thing one day and something completely different the next. Everything's acceptable. Let's just let culture drive us as I feel good in myself that I'm right with God. Hosanna, son of David, to saying, I'm going to hurl abuse. If you're going to destroy the temple, rebuild it in three days, then save yourself. You're not so big, are you? Not too different from the Christian religion who likes to prop up men, prominent ministries everywhere, and then easily, easily kick them when they're down. Not that they deserve to be up where they were, but we build them up so that when they fall, we can go, aha, I knew you were a hypocrite. The cultural Religious people love to be self-righteous in that way, to call out the highest of the religious people. And finally, you've got the religious wicked. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him and saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we'll believe in him. He trusts in God, let God rescue him now if he delights in him. For he said, I am the son of God. These are the ones who are in charge. Looking directly at truth and denying it. Went to Pilate and said, hurry, we must get him off the cross because we know whoever, whoever hangs on a tree overnight is despicable. We don't want to break God's law by leaving him on the cross. So we must be not defiled by getting him down. Meanwhile, we'll kill him. All these were there. Father, forgive them. These are the kind of people I want you to forgive. No one is excused. None. Those who say, I never heard of Christ. The ignorant wicked, they were there. Those who heard a little, but, but I never really got taught well, but you knew. Those who were in and out of the synagogues, depending on their feelings. Those who taught are all there. Everyone represented as being saved throughout the pages of the New Testament. Father, forgive them, but they don't know what they're doing. That was the first three hours. Three hours of surviving on the cross until verse 45. From the sixth hour, darkness fell upon all the land until the ninth hour. That was the first of six miracles. And the first is judgment. Judgment on Israel because they rejected their Messiah. They rejected the truth and judgment on his son who became sin for us. When God brings darkness, 
he brings judgment. In Exodus, one of the last plagues, God brought darkness. And it was a darkness so dark it could even be felt. This darkness was actually recorded throughout various places in Roman history. Even went to the Caesar about a darkness that took place. And why this is a miracle is because it was Passover. Passover is a full moon. Passover is when the moon's on the other side of the earth. You don't have an eclipse. Even though that's the word that Luke used, the Greek word for eclipse. There's no moon anywhere nearby. But now there's a darkness completely covering. And, and it shows judgment, but I, th I believe it does show us one other thing. It shows us. God said, you're not going to see what it means to suffer the wrath of God and separation as they heard his cries in the darkness. Not for anyone to record, only to hear the first of those miracles. This was enduring the greatest humiliation. Why do I say humiliation? Well, again, the writer of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews chapter 12, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He was humiliated by all types of people, the ones he came to save, the ones he came to teach, the ones he came to be with. They were humiliating him, him as much as they possibly could while he was in the greatest amount of pain. He endured the greatest humiliation. So he defeated the greatest temptation. He endured the greatest humiliation for us. And then finally, he had a cry of the greatest vindication. He had a cup to deal with. He had a cross to endure. And now he had cries, actually three of them. Verse 46, about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Really wanted to meditate on this, and it's interesting. Not many people can say much about it. It is the only time in Scripture, the only time when Jesus addresses his Father as God. The only time. During the second three hours on the cross, when it's completely dark, but notice here, something that will help us interpret this. I, I mean, I understand he's saying, but your question, or at least my question is, as I look at this and I say, Lord, why would Jesus ask the question, why? Again, we go and say, well, in his humanity, six hours on the cross, it's so much. Why am I enduring this? Yet he preached that, he taught that. The scripture's right about that. It doesn't make sense to me that he would now be defeated in his humanity and say, why? Yet we do know there was immense suffering. Notice in verse 46, about the ninth hour. You see that? What does that mean? Darkness went from the sixth to the ninth hour. How long is about? I don't know. It could be 10 seconds. I don't know. But it's at the end, isn't it? It's not in the middle. It's not after one hour or one hour 30. It's right at the end. He says, Eli, Eli, my God, my God. Lama Sabachthani, why have you forsaken me? That could be a question for Jesus, or it could be a question for them, the people, and us. Why? 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 
to set up the greatest joy ever. Why? Because nine hours, three hours of wrath of God, done. Why? They couldn't hear it. They couldn't see it. Verses 47 to 49. He's calling for Elijah. It would sound similar. Eli, Eliah. Similar to a man on the cross. From a man on the cross. So they run and get a sponge, give it with wine, help him a little bit. Let's see if Elijah's going to come to save him. They had no idea. As he's saying, why did I do this? Why are you forsaking me? I need you to hear. I think this answers the question. Why there's no flag at half-mast on Good Friday. Why there's nothing but a token holiday for those Christians. Why we tolerate the morality of Christians in our society. Because we have no idea why. To cover my sins. The world doesn't understand at all. Yet he poured it out right here. Why? And since he knew why himself, he had a second cry we find in the Gospel of John. Tetelestai! It is finished. That's why. And as soon as he said, it is finished, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he gave his life. He gave his life. And why the next six miracles are joyful. They're not judgment. Darkness was judgment. The death was a miracle because he gave his life. Nobody can just give your life. He gave it right there and expired. The veil of the temple was torn in two, which is the veil between the Holy of Holies and the outer veil. It is literally the thickness from your wrist to the tip of your middle finger. That's the thickness of the curtain, and it tore straight down the middle. That sound would be heard all the way to the cross. Never to be repaired, saying, God is saying with a smile, we have peace. We have peace. I've given you peace. Earthquakes that split rocks. As he said in the back, I have shaken the earth. I will shake it once more. This is shaking for wake up. Wake up. And only Matthew records in verses 52 and 53, the tombs were opened, many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and they came out of the tombs after his resurrection, not before. He is the first fruits. And they came and revealed themselves. They entered the holy city, appeared to many. What did they say? We don't know. Who did they reveal, appear to? We don't know. How long were they there? We don't know. Were they glorified or were they regular bodies? We don't know. It's just there to say the resurrection is true. And finally, a miracle of salvation in verse 54, the centurion, the ignorant wicked, looked at all this going on and said, truly, this was the Son of God. When God does a work in your heart and you can now see why he was forsaken, you're never the same. You can't go back. You are changed. And what we just pray is that we could get from Jesus what he said in Hebrews 12 too, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. It turned it into a day of vindication, jubilation, great joy. This cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In that moment of darkness, it was about the ninth hour, not the ninth hour. So yes, it was his God, not his father at that time. But he asked the question for himself, saying, oh, answer me. And God was silent. Or was it for them to hear in the midst of the darkness, the son saying, yes, I am being forsaken. Your question is why? I'm going to show you why. For your new life. 
That's why it's Good Friday. We have one who defeated the greatest temptation with a cup. He endured the greatest humiliation on the cross. And he cried out with actually the greatest voice of jubilation, of vindication, with that cry. It is finished. And because of those three acts, this is Good Friday. We can't do anything about flags not being raised or lowered. We can't do anything about the fact that there's holiday and we take that occasion to meet with family and friends. That's all part of culture, what we do. But it does affect how we go about the day and understanding. We are who we are because of Him. And that's everything. And this is what He did for us. But He showed us with the cup, it was hope that defeated the temptation. On the cross, it was faith, which is what? It's acting on what you hope for. Faith is the evidence of things hoped for. What's the evidence that Christ had hope? He hung on that cross. So he, by faith, as fully man, fully God, he hung there knowing what was going to happen. And when he cried out, that was nothing but love. Faith, hope, actually hope, faith, and love on those three acts right there. What does Paul say in all his epistles? I praise you for your hope, faith, and love. Things that are accessible to us because of what he did. So I just want you to be thinking through this. The scriptures of what God has given us on Good Friday. I'm so glad to be able to share it with you here, even this morning, as this will be like burning coals in us through the day as we anticipate Resurrection Sunday. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, your goodness to us. Lord, you handled the depth. We could never, ever go so far as to think we know it all or to think that we truly can understand you. You handled the, the depth so far, and because of that, the breadth of changed lives extends into the billions. Because of this day, Lord, you've made peace, and you yourself have great joy of what you have accomplished in bringing many sons to glory through your Son, Jesus Christ. And anticipate that day as our change becomes final and complete that we rejoice with one another. Hail to the King of kings and Lord of lords. And we commit this to Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Go and enjoy your time, family and friends, remembering the great joy we have of being in Christ.